be here at TCU and to hear the incredibly high standards of the musicians. Uh, I was kind of bowled over yesterday when I went to the rehearsals and heard Circus Maximus and then this morning these two pieces played, uh, Promenade Overture and Fern Hill, with such beauty. I mean, they really understand the music. I think this is one of the great things universities can do by rehearsing pieces properly, unlike many symphony orchestras that are limited to two days rehearsal in a concert. They can really get under the skin of the piece. And I must say, the conductors and people performing did get under the skin of both of those pieces, and I think you'll find in the next piece very much under the skin. These pieces um, are part of my life, uh, in a sense, Fern Hill I wrote when I was 21 years old. And I had a high school teacher, Mrs. Bella Tillis, who only died a year or two ago. And she encouraged me to be a composer. My parents were naturally against this. Uh, I'm sure you all understand. But music, actually my father was a musician, a, a violinist, and my mother a pianist. But they didn't want me to go into a, such a hard world as composing where they felt I would never do anything. And um, so the encouragement came from Mrs. Tillis, and when I graduated from a bachelor's degree in Columbia, I wrote her a piece called Fern Hill based on Dylan Thomas's poem about his childhood, his youth. And it's about youth, and it always says, youth held me green and golden until the last verse when it says, youth held me green and dying and you begin to realize that it's the beginning of Dylan Thomas's long, so slow progress to his early death. Um, it requires an innocence of sound and beauty of sound and an understanding of, of the words. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, the lights were out, I noticed, so you couldn't read the text, which was here in the book. Uh, but sometime when you can, read this beautiful text and I'm sure a lot of the words of the chorus were not understandable, but they will be understandable when you read the, this text. So this was an early piece, and um, the opening piece, Promenade Overture, was written in 1980 for 81 performance by the Boston Pops, and it was commissioned by John Williams. Uh, this was the 150th anniversary of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and he had one commission, from the Boston Symphony, because the Boston Pops is the Boston Symphony. And he called me and asked me if I would write a piece, and I'm very happy to say yes, uh, as you can imagine. But I thought, what would I write for an audience that is very sophisticated, uh, and at the same time, out to have a wonderful time and a wonderful evening. And I wrote this promenade overture because, of course, I knew of the Haydn famous Farewell Symphony. And in the Farewell Symphony, as you know, the players exit one by one until there are just two players left and they blow their candles out in those days and leave. And the diminishing of the orchestra is the point of the last movement of that piece. So I said, what would happen if I turned it backwards and started with an empty stage and then <clears throat> with just a percussion fanfare, the conductor enters, cues, and we start on the top of the instruments, the piccolo, then the flutes and the oboes and clarinets, and then, of course, the, the horns and trumpets and trombones, and went down to the percussion and the strings, and, and we finally build the whole orchestra. And in fact, the opening fanfare played by the brass is the ending of the Haydn Farewell Symphony backwards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you don't have to know that, but it's fun to know that it just starts out with exactly the notes Haydn wrote and goes backwards to make the fanfares. So this is a happy piece, and it was written in the 80s, 1980, and performed in 81 by the Boston Symphony. Now the last piece on the program is a big piece, and it was performed first by Jerry Junkin and the Austin Band in, um, I'm trying to remember the date, but it was over 10 years ago. And Jerry had been trying to convince me to write a um, piece for band, and I was fearful of them, because I'd only written one band piece, and it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with it. 
and I didn't think I could ask virtuoso things I ask of the symphony orchestra. But in fact, I did ask for those things, and Jerry performed them, and this band will perform sounding like a major symphony orchestra. Uh, it's quite amazing. Are we all seated? Because uh, I want you to just know that there are eight sections of this piece, Circus Maximus. The first is introitus, which is the introduction fanfares that you will hear with trumpets all around the hall, 11 trumpets scattered around the hall. Um, and then you will hear the orchestra and the trumpets and three percussionists in the hall in the back playing with percussionists on stage. And these fanfares continue until we reach a climax and we get into the second movement, which is called Screen Slash Siren. The sirens in ancient Rome and ancient Greece were the um, wonderful women who lured the sailors to their death by making this beautiful music. And the saxophone quartet, which is somewhere up there, will lure the other members of the exterior orchestra to join them uh, just the way screen sirens, like people who, beautiful women who display toothpaste ads and car ads and all sorts of stuff, lure you to buy a product. And the Circus Maximus of old, I just must tell you, was in ancient Rome and lived, lasted for a thousand years from the beginning of Rome's history to its downfall and it was the mega of entertainment. 250,000 people a day came to the Circus Maximus. And we have created a Circus Maximus here with instruments all around you, a marching band in the back of the hall, a full stage band here, uh, all sorts of things, clarinet here, two French horns here, and um, they will join with you. Uh, and the next movement after Screen Siren is called Channel Surfing, something you all know. Uh, and it has to do with our impatience for the new and our 500 channels to look at the new in. And in this wild channel surfing, uh, you will hear different, in, different choirs of instruments, the, 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 the French horns playing one kind of uh, uh, channel, the, the, the uh, saxes playing another kind, the offstage, uh, marching band playing another kind, and they will all merge into a giant recapitulation of the introitus, leading to two night musics. The first is the night music of the country, and it's quiet, and you'll hear wolf calls, brilliantly played, I must say, in this performance by the French horns, who will sound like wolves when they play, and it's out in the peaceful desert where calm is and the second night music is the night music of the city, starting with a um, clarinet riff up in the rafters and then taken over by the nervous, agitated city, <coughs> fighting, music in the streets, all sorts of sirens blaring, leading to the giant Circus Maximus climax in which all the themes have been played, get played at once into a sensory overload. And you will hear that sensory overload as you hear the stage band playing and the marching band marching and calls going around in the trumpets all over. And this leads to the climax of the piece, a huge chord that is held for a minute and a half by the orchestra band. Um, and finally, we hear a prayer which starts out with an English horn solo, which is a hope that things will be reconciled and that the wildness that we love and are still afraid of uh, will somehow resolve itself. And yet the opening introitus um, kind of fanfare-like things start reappearing until we hear the conclusion of the work, which as you've been told is a gunshot, which leaves a question mark as to what <coughs> will happen. And it's a question mark we all have in our minds and we live with every day. So I hope you enjoy this overly wild, exuberant, joy-filled and yet fear-filled version of um, my thoughts in Circus Maximus. Hope you enjoy it.